We'll get started. We are reconvening uh, following an executive session. Um, welcome to those of you who are joining us in person as well as via uh, as well as via our live meeting stream. This meeting is reconvening following the call to order and roll call uh, at 425 p.m. when the board moved into executive session pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024H and 4B. And now I'd like to um, have Colonel Sullivan lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Matson, are there any updates to the agenda? There was one update to the agenda and the board was notified of this. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Seeing none, are there any items to be added to the agenda? May we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. I should just say as a point of uh, reference that Mr. Temby is is remote. Um, but it, oh, as as well as Mr. Gregory. That's right. That's right. They're they're both they're both remote. As well as Allison Cortez. So there's a few of us that are remote. All right, Colonel Sullivan, you have the quote. Good evening, everyone. My quote today is: "Success is not final." Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And this quote's been attributed to Winston Churchill, to the former Speaker of the House, uh, Sam Rayburn, as well as the 1938 Budweiser commercial. So not exactly sure the, the correct origins of it, but I, I thought as we started a, a new school year here, whether we're administrators, teachers, staff, or parents, uh, it's a good lesson for all of our kids as they, they embark on a, another difficult semester. But I've certainly been fortunate to have both uh, many successes and many failures in my life and, and I've learned uh, arguably probably more from the failures but I've learned from them all so I just offer that for thought as we get started tonight. Thank you. Thank you Colonel Sullivan. Miss Allen do we have anyone signed up to speak to the board this evening? Yes we do we have 13 speakers signed up. The board welcomes public comments in the interest of respecting the time of all who are present speakers must have signed up to address the board prior to 4 p.m. and they must limit their remarks to three minutes or less. We also ask speakers to address the board and not others in the room. All speakers will be notified of the remaining time via the mounted monitors behind the dais. When the time has ended, the microphone will turn off. Supplemental written materials can be given to the secretary security guards who are seated in the hallway outside of the boardroom, and they will be delivered to the board secretary. Profanity or any disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated. We greatly value all comments from the public. However, the board will not respond this evening. Our first speaker this evening is Jennifer Kent. Rewind. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Kent. Last month at the December 9th school board meeting, Mr. Temby and Mr. Gregory both mentioned being inspired by the Bridges program graduation ceremony. Their statements stuck with me and got me thinking about what inspires me, which turned into a rabbit trail of researching what inspiration means as one does when they're awake at night and can't fall asleep. I came across a quote that hit me hard and made me think. Mary Morrissey once said, inspiration without action is really entertainment. So while something can be very inspiring, it is not transformative until you actually do something with it, end quote. Cue the deeper self-reflection. Am I allowing inspiration to be entertainment or am I taking action? Beyond just taking action, am I taking meaningful action? At that point, I thought about the inspiring people around me. I thought of my children's teachers first. These professionals inspire me by the way they handle my kids with grace, while managing classrooms full of students with unique needs. They differentiate instruction while managing student behavior, all the while attending meetings and fulfilling other duties within their schools. Their ability to adapt their teaching these last three school years is inspirational. Is the time I spend volunteering meaningful action? 
Next, I thought of the families we know with medically complex children. They advocate for their kids relentlessly. They know medical histories forwards and backwards. They are the experts in their children. They inspire me with their tenacity, their love, and their advocacy. Is taking a meal to a parent staying with their child while impatient, meaningful action? Am I doing as much as I am able? Rather than taking you on my full journey of self-reflection, I'll end with inviting you to join me in reflecting on Mary Morrissey's quote. Inspiration without action is really entertainment. So while something can be very inspiring, it is not transformative until you actually do something with it. Let us be inspired and let us follow that inspiration with meaningful action. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Brian Grady. Good evening, my name is Brian Grady and I want to notify the board of the untruthful statements made to the Gazette by District 20 in the December 12th article about the hiring of Mr. Payne. The article indicated that all phone calls and messages between Mr. Gregory and Susan Payne were related to her being the school liaison to public health. The conversation between Mr. Gregory and Susan Payne on the security director posting date of December 11th, 2020 was not related to her duties as school liaison for public health. Academy District 20 was in remote learning after the Thanksgiving break for the remainder of the fall 2020 semester. Clearly the phone call was to notify her of the security director posting and not anything to do with public health. Mr. Gregory stated in his first all staff meeting that he wanted everyone to own, his, own their decisions, yet he fails to own his own. Susan Hudson, uh, Richard Payne was allowed by Mr. Gregory to interview for a position that he did not meet the minimum educational requirements and should have been screened out. This is a violation of policy GBEA staff ethics and conflicts of interest, which states, quote, all staff members shall avoid any action which could result in or create the appearance of using public office for inappropriate private gain or giving inappropriate preferential treatment to any person. Allowing Mr. Payne to interview for the security director position when he doesn't meet the qualifications is giving inappropriate preferential treatment. Five qualified candidates also interviewed. After final interviews, no selection is made and Mr. Smith's uh, position is created. The security director position is reposted and now requires the required qualifications are changed so Mr. Payne meets the minimum requirements. He subsequently was hired at 15,000 more than the maximum salary range, more preferential treatment by Mr. Gregory. The article stated that Mr. Payne had travel plans when he was hired, which is fine. The facts are that he did not submit any time off until a day after a CORA request was filed on November 2nd, 2021. When I went, met with Mr. Smith on November 11th and pointed out that Mr. Payne did not claim uh, July 1st and 2nd, Mr. Smith told me he was working those days, he didn't have to claim time for those days and refused to tell me what he was doing as there was certainly no evidence that he worked those days. The article stated that Mr. Payne did use the wrong type of leave and that the issue has since been addressed and clarified with Mr. Payne. He claimed time off for July 1st and 2nd on December the 8th, but still claimed staff leave for September 6th through the 16th. Only after an additional CORA request is filed on December 13th to verify the accuracy of the Gazette statements by District 20 does Mr. Payne change his time off from staff leave to paid time off on December 14th. These are clear violations of policy that show Mr. Payne's true character and Mr. Smith's lack of supervisory oversight. The fact that the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources does not recognize this as a policy violation is inexplicable. It's a new year. Let's start telling the truth and holding people accountable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jody Fletcher. Good evening, board. Um, longtime parent, been a parent in Academy School District 20 since 1999. I have a 2008, 2012, 2021 graduate of Liberty High School, and I have a sophomore at Liberty. On December the 9th, I received a text message from my 15 year old nephew who is African American and on an IEP. He indicated to me that his teacher was accusing him of being under the influence of drugs in front of his entire class. I kind of let it go. I was at work. I'm a school administrator. I was busy. I'm like, whatever, I'll, you know, we'll deal with this. I then get an email from said teacher saying she was concerned that he had red eyes and she wanted to make sure that, you know, he was okay. That was not how she said it. 
So I emailed her back because the implication was that he was under the influence of drugs. She has called him a liar on multiple occasions about going to after school tutoring. She has refused to comply with his IEP. And so I lost my mind. I'm not going to be very, you know, uncool about it. I was livid. I was supposed to be at the board meeting that night and I didn't come because I didn't want you to think I was a raving lunatic. I am an angry mama auntie bear. Okay, listen. I understand that high school kids use drugs, middle school kids use drugs, but to call a child in front of a class out is 100% unprofessional. I immediately called Alan Timmig. I immediately called Tom Gregory on his cell phone, did not get a response. Um, the next morning, Mr. Gregory's secretary called me back. Nobody called me back from Liberty, nobody. Um, Mr. Jim Smith called me Friday. We had a very long conversation about this. When I said to the teacher in a response, why, it feels like you're you know, making an allegation. Oh, no, no, no. I just wanted to make sure his story matched yours. Put yourself in my shoes, people. I admire what you do. I don't have the time to volunteer to do this stuff. But we have dealt with two straight years at Liberty High School of IEPs being violated, this kid being accused of all different kinds of things. He's a 6'3 black kid. He doesn't hide easily. He's been called the N-word. Kids are allowed to wear MAGA hats at school. He's terrified to even wear a mask because kids are going to bully him. This isn't OK. Put a call in today to the Office of Civil Rights. His special education case manager is a rock star. She bends over backwards, works with teachers, and teachers still choose not to follow the IEP. They didn't have finals because they had unit exams, end of units. Per his IEP, he's allowed to do makeups and corrections. We were told yesterday for the math class, nope, the department doesn't allow that. So I'm putting you guys on notice. I am moving forward with litigation. We have to treat our kids equitably, whether they're white, black, special ed, or Our next speaker is Katherine Spencer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Katherine Spencer, and I'm speaking to you today as an employee of the district, the daughter of a retired employee of the district, the sister of a graduate of the district, and the parent of a senior at Pine Creek High School. So as you can see, I've worked in District 20 since 2001. I have a lot of heart, tears, and yes, even blood at times devoted to my career as an academy employee. However, I'm not sure I can last much longer under current and projected policies and decisions made and being made by this administration. I'm here today mostly to talk about the upcoming proposal to move high school teachers to be six of eight without additional compensation next year. I'm not sure you quite understand what high school teachers in our district of excellence do and face in order for our district to continue to be excellent. So let me share with you some numbers from my own classes. I am a high school English teacher. This semester, I actually am six of eight because I agreed to take on a senior lit class overload for the extra compensation. I also have one AP class of 24 students, two honors freshman classes totaling 60 students, three senior English classes totaling 91 students for a grand total of 175 different students. That means 175 different families to contact, 175 different data dives to do in PSAT, SAT, etc., 175 different relationships to foster and grow. One of my friends works at a middle school in our district. Though she teaches six of eight already, as all middle school teachers do, she pointed out that she only has 97 students on, on her team to track, even though she has most of those kids twice. But that means she only has 97 families to contact, 97 relationships to foster. I have twice as many of those this year. In terms of planning and grading, in the terms of, in the interest of full disclosure, I have been teaching six or seven out of late, out of eight for the past three years because I have been compensated for that. I understand that when I, um, sorry, I lost my place. I do this so willingly, though sometimes grumpily, because I know that giving up my personal time is and was valued by the district because you compensated me for that. Um, let's see, under the current, under the six of eight for next year, which by the way, has not been officially communicated by this board or superintendent to the high school employees in the district. Are you planning on doing that at some point or are you hoping to officially sneak it in at the end of the year, hoping that by then we'll be too tired, too busy or too distracted to notice? 
But as I was saying, under the six of eight plan for next year, you expect me to do the same work I'm doing this semester, but with a $7,000 pay cut. That shows you do not value my time as I need to. Just as a minutes kind of thing, um, my one class of seniors, their grading last semester took me 21,150 minutes of grading, which was 352 and a half hours of grading in addition. Our next speaker is Heather Bunnell. Hi, I spoke last time kind of about, about from my own perspective, um, but tonight I wanted to read a letter from a former Pine Creek teacher who is no longer here because she couldn't afford to work from here. Um, I was a teacher and coach for D20 from the years 2016 to 2020 at Pine Creek High School. I moved to Colorado Springs from Stockton, California, where I worked as a high school teacher and a student activities director. My husband and I moved from California to be near my aging parents and most of my family. I was hesitant at first to move to Colorado because of the pay cut I would sustain, but I was told often and by many that it would be a cheaper place to live in utilities, gas, and cost of living. In my research, I found that the cost of living index at that time was equal to that of Stockton, California, but my husband and I weighed the pros and cons, and being near my parents was the main reason we made the move. I took the job and a $30,000 pay cut. My first year at Pine Creek was interesting. While I worked tirelessly as an English teacher usually does, my husband and I were living paycheck to paycheck. We were renting a house we thought temporarily until we could get our bearings and figure out where we wanted to live. The rent for our house in an older part of town, D11, was $1,450 a month, $250 more than we were paying in California. I decided early, after that first year that I needed to make more money. I sold my prep, prep period, took on additional duties like speech and debate coach, sophomore class advisor. Then I took an accelerated 365 day program to obtain my MA. I graduated with my degree in August of 2018. We were still in the rental. The housing market had skyrocketed and I was overworked 250 hours alone for coaching speech and debate, and I didn't make enough money to get us into our own home. Yes, my husband owned his own successful marketing business this entire time. When my husband became sick and after a year and a half died of cancer, I had to make a decision I never thought I'd have to make. As a professional woman holding two degrees and a reputation of being a good teacher, I could not afford to live in Colorado Springs by myself. The rent alone was half my take home pay. The landlords never increased the rent. I chose to move where one of my sons lived, Northwest Arkansas, because the cost of living was so much better. I took a job in Rogers, Arkansas for 18,000 more than I made at D20. I had to leave my parents who had come to depend on me for rides, grocery trips, and companionship. I had to leave a place where my husband was buried. I moved to a place that is 45 minutes away from my son and our schedules conflict for making visiting each other easy or often. I moved the first summer of COVID. It's been a year and a half. I own my own home, but I have no family or friends here. D20's pay scale is an insult to teachers. Whenever I would bring up our lack of pay, I was told over and over again, yeah, but we have good kids. Guess what? These good kids didn't pay my bills or give me a way to stay in Colorado or take care of my parents. I have good kids here in Arkansas. There are good, good kids everywhere. How embarrassing is it for me to have to tell my story and state that Colorado is in the bottom five states for teacher pay of the 50 states? It absolutely makes zero sense in 2022 that a professional degree holder can't afford to live in humbly on teacher pay and D20. Sincerely, Regina McNulty. Our next speaker is Karen Harvey. Good evening, Mr. President and members of the board. My name is Dr. Karen Harvey, and I served as a board member in Douglas County and understand the important role you play in ensuring that students are educated in the basics. I'm here tonight to speak to the proposed revisions of the Colorado State Social Studies Standards, specifically the history section. My concerns are that if adopted, the critical race theory they are including will be used to indoctrinate our students as young as first grade. For example, teachers are to ask their first graders, how are African-American, Latino, Asian-American, indigenous peoples, LBGT and religious minorities um, cultures different from and similar to one another. I taught elementary school, served as an elementary principal, and I have a master's degree in elementary counseling. I found that this curriculum is developmentally inappropriate for elementary and middle school students where this same information is included in the standards. Imagine yourself as a first grade teacher asking students how LGBT are different from and similar to one another. First, the teacher would have to explain uh, lesbians are girls who like girls. Well, Susie thinks my best friend's Mary. 
I must be a lesbian. She then explains that gays are boys who like boys. Matt is my best friend. I must be a gay. You get the picture. I researched extensively and could find no evidence of LGBT contributing to the history of America. If our governor wants LGBT in the curriculum, put it in the health curriculum at the high school where these students are developmentally prepared for this discussion. There are many other disturbing concepts included, but I do not have time to present them all in my three minutes. I would ask that everyone go to the Colorado Department of Education website, click on the standards, go to social studies, and there you can present your concerns as I have. If we do not speak out, this will be passed by the state school board. Based on the concerns, my concerns and concerns of others, the state board extended the timeline for comments to February 1st. The problem was they first had the comments during the holidays. I would ask that if this inappropriate content is approved by the State Board of Education, the District 20 School Board adopt a quote, in opt-in policy for the history standards, whereby you advise the parents of what is being taught at each grade level and the parents must sign a form stating they want their students included. In this manner, all students are excluded except for those parents who feel this is appropriate. And the Board of Education has followed the dictate from the state to teach it, but parents that do not agree do not have their children do it. For the students whose parents do not opt in to this inappropriate information, they could have an additional math or ELA time since 40% of our students in District 20 are not performing at grade level in ELA and 49% are not at grade level in math in grades three for eight. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Jackie Lesh. Good evening. Tonight, I'm actually reading the comments of a D20 staff person who was worried about retaliation if she said the comments. Um, so I'm going to read them on their behalf. The definition of exhaustion, a state of extreme physical or mental fatigue, the action or state of being of something used up completely. Our teachers and support staff are exhausted. They are leaving our district and the profession. District employees are resigning because they are not supported or valued by the administration. I have heard this again and again. Planning time is being removed and lunches are often shared with students due to lack of staff. Pay and benefits do not allow our entry level teachers and classified staff to comfor comfortably reside in District 20 boundaries. District 20 employees deserve better, but we need your help to get there. I'm talking to you teachers, especially our elementary school teachers, paraprofessionals, substitutes, nurses, psychologists, building managers, custodians, maintenance staff, maintenance staff, cafeteria staff, security secretaries, and that is just to name a few. If you are paid by the district, you're welcome to the Academy Education Association. The EAEA is a part of the regional Pikes Peak Education Association, the state Colorado Education Association, and the country national educator association. Our voices are more powerful together. We need more members to obtain collective bargaining power. We are here and we will continue to fight for better pay, benefits, and schedules. We need a seat at the table for significant change. Please visit ppea.org for more information. And just to let you know, all of the teachers and staff, everyone in D20, we are here. There are a number of parents who support you and we would love to see you get together so that way you have a collective bargaining voice that we can support you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Claudia Graver. Hello board and happy new year. Um, I'm a D20 sub. I'm a mom of two teenage sons in D20, a wife of a 26 year military member. Um, so I just want to say Happy New Year. I was in San Diego over the holidays, and um, I don't know if you know, but San Diego was really kind of locked down. Governor, um, Governor, sorry, Governor Newsom 
enacted a mask mandate beginning December 15th and um, it's now through the February 15th something or, or other, might be late. Um, masks were everywhere. So we were, um, and so were the mask shamers. I was walking in a neighborhood with my family, uh, no one else was around, and a woman alone in her car um, slowed down, rolled down her window and yelled for us to put our masks on. Um, it's a different world in California and New York, and I just want to say thank you again for getting rid of the mask mandates, and I want to let you know that we are here, um, that we are watching, and we are supporting our new board members. Um, I also want to say that I worked as a uh, long-term sub last year at um, Challenger Middle School. I loved it. I loved working with the kids. Um, I was an elective teacher. And um, as a D20 sub, you get paid a certain rate, um, which is pretty good. And as a long-term sub, I got paid even better, which is really good. And I know that teachers get paid even more than long-term subs. So I'm just saying that the pay is pretty good. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christy Simpson. Hi there. My name is Christy Simpson. I have three children in the D20 district. Um, I want to thank all of the board members here for either remaining in or joining the school board in such contentious. So really appreciate your service and your sacrifice of time. Um, as I listen, oh, I want to express my encouragement and support for the new board members as they ran on issues that obviously overwhelmingly resonated with our community. I'm so very hopeful for the future of this district. As I listened online to the public comments from the last board meeting, I was deeply saddened to hear words such as this, and I quote, teachers should not be worried about teaching cultural diversity or correct history. Also, I am concerned that this new board is only going to focus on academics. Goodness, I am sure expecting that this boy, board is going to focus on ed, um, education and academics in our schools. I think that is up, of utmost importance. And I hope that you remember that you were all elected by an overwhelming majority and most of this community really has your back. Now I'd like to express my concern about some of the new courses up for approval for Liberty High School. Um, the four courses in uh, that I'm talking about are the tenor bass choir, which is currently called men's choir, the tenor bass ensemble, and the treble choir, which is currently called women's choir, and the treble ensemble, which is called currently women's ensemble. Here is the wording in the current proposal. This choir course is this um, describing the need, the need for this change. This choir course is the same as the existing D20 men's choir. I am proposing we create this newly named course to better include all tenor and bass singers. So I decided to look up the words tenor and bass in the dictionary. And for simplicity, I used a children's dictionary, so it would be short. The definition of bass in this dictionary is the lowest male singing voice. The definition for tenor is the highest male singing voice. So OK, this is a tenor bass choir for male voices, but um, how many high school no students know the difference between tenor and bass versus the definition of knowing what a choir is? Why do we need to change the wording in this? Um, and then I decided I would look at why do we need to make this so complicated? Um, I decided to look at the wording of other high schools in D20. So similar classes in Pine Creek, their courses are called the men's choir is Thor Z men. And the women's is women's ensemble. They have the names in there of men and women. Rampart High School has similar courses, men's choir and Miraness, which is Old English for joyful woman. Why does this need to change? I would like to encourage the board not to approve the name changing in pre-existing courses for Liberty High School's proposed courses, including the tenor bass choir, tenor bass ensemble, treble choir. Thank you, ma'am, your time's up. Our next speaker is Laura Furia. Good evening, everyone. Uh, a lot of you have heard me speak before. I usually talk about the Rampart High School parking lot, but I have no updates on that tonight. So I'm going to talk about um, a different aspect of uh, safety and health, and it is COVID related. Um, I know that everyone on the board and in the administration who has put their input into um, 
COVID protocols in the district have their best intentions. Um, but I want the announcements to come out from Mr. Gregory to stop saying that they're following the El Paso County Health Department guidelines because they're not. Um, the, health, the El Paso County Health Department still recommends masking no matter the vaccination status. It's not mandated, so I know you guys don't have to mandate it. Um, but the other thing is, is that you've decided to do away with quarantines and notifying all people, all close contacts of other people who've tested positive, um, that they've been in contact with someone else. Now, the El Paso County Health Department guidelines say many things um, that are requirements that are not being met right now. One, that, okay, if both parties are masked and vaccinated, then they don't have to be told and quarantined. Okay, but you're not requiring masks or vaccinations. Two, positivity rates, um, if they're less than 35 per 100,000 in a seven day period, Right now, we're at about 900 out of 100,000 in a seven day period. So clearly we're not meeting that. And three vaccination rates, if they exceed 80% in a school, then you don't need to do these quarantines. Well, partially we don't know what the numbers are, but I can guarantee you in the elementary and middle schools, 80% of the students are not vaccinated. So why you think it's okay to tell everyone that you're following the El Paso County Health Guidelines beyond me because you're clearly not so i just want you guys to be clear whatever the decisions um the decision making process that has led to these rules just don't lie about it thank you our next speaker is deb curtis hi thank you my name is Deb Curtis. And I'm a parent in District 20. I'm concerned many of our educators are unhappy. They deserve a positive working environment, adequate pay, and greater emphasis on their health and well being. I've never before felt the need to become active in following the decisions of a school board until the last several months. I watched communications last semester about the bus driver shortages canceling routes. What are we going to do if enough teachers get fed up to the point we don't have enough educators? Today, I'd like to speak about a discussion I had with a teacher over the holiday. This teacher loves their job and the children they work with adore them, but they're burned out. Like many others, this educator gives so much more than is expected without compensation for the extra time and effort dedicated to their profession. This educator teaches many advanced classes, clubs, and often stays late to tutor children on personal time. This is why it was disheartening to hear how moving to a proposed 6-8 required schedule next year will put a huge strain on this educator and essentially result in a cut in pay due to decisions that have to be made as a result of the change. The teacher is disappointed in the lack of support from the district and the superintendent. I was concerned when I observed that our new members of the board were not educators. If you haven't taught in the public school system, it's impossible to understand the demands of a teacher. As a former teacher and substitute, I can attest that teaching takes a lot more out of our educators than the hours they spend in classrooms. After teachers leave their classrooms, there are assignments to be graded, time spent worrying about students struggling, more recently fear and anxiety that parents will make assumptions and not act like adults to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about concerns. These teachers are overworked, underpaid, and constantly walking around on eggshells. They're afraid to joke with their students to build rapport and relationship for fear a parent will hear of a joke, take it out of context, and slander the educator on social media instead of having an adult conversation. The 6 eight schedule proposed for next year will create a significant burden on teachers and cause many to look for other jobs. I implore you to reconsider this decision. Several D20 educators have expressed how they love teaching until this year where it feels like no one cares about them. Educators are being pushed to work harder than ever before and aren't being recognized for their selfless devotion to our children. They aren't being compensated appropriately and they're being forced to work in unsafe hostile environments. Please do your jobs and put our educators first. Focus on their well-being so they can give their full attention and energy to all the students in the classroom. If there's anything I can drive home to you tonight, please let it be these three thoughts. First, our teachers deserve an environment where they aren't overworked to a breaking point, where they feel like they have no choice but to leave a profession they love. Next, champion for better pay and raises so our educators can do their jobs without worrying how they're going to pay their bills. 
And finally, put our educators' health and wellness to the forefront. Show them how important they are in our district, especially now as a highly contagious variant is circling through the community. Our D Thank you, your time's up. Our next speaker is John Worth. Good evening. I am John Worth, the administrator of School in the Woods and a D20 employee for the past 32 years. Recently, a Netflix movie called Don't Look Up was viewed by millions. Scientists tried desperately to warn of an approaching comet that would wipe out life on Earth. Much of the population chose to disregard vital scientific information. People blatantly chose not to look up to see the crisis looming. They chose instead to look down unaware, uninformed, and unwilling to act. In this new year, I urge our D20 board, our administration, and community to look up, seek knowledge and understanding to proactively confront the challenges we face in our district. I believe Tom Gregory looked up and was forward thinking by implementing the strategic planning process. So many caring people, many over here, work collaboratively to improve our district in ways so all could thrive. Tom and our dedicated leadership team demonstrated taking risks, thinking outside the box, having challenging conversations, and having desire to make structural changes needed to ensure that we truly live up to our new mission and values. Many committees and their members spent substantial amounts of hours conducting public meetings, hearing from a wide range of constituents and surveying thousands of people. I was fortunate to be on the Strategic Planning Committee and Think Tank. We looked back reflectively, but spent more time looking up, looking forward to our D20 future, envisioning, envisioning a district our stakeholders imagine and strongly desire. We must recognize that progress forward requires looking up, gaining insights, and recognizing the changes needed in existing structures. We must do this boldly, knowing true change takes courage and diligent effort. In the Community Forwards group, we look up. While parents and students share voices and lived experiences, students desperately want to know their voices matter. Many feel academics supersede their emotional well being. Changes are necessary so students have voice in their education. Given the horrific escalation in the COVID pandemic with the highly transmissible Omicron variant, we must all look up and recognize the safety concerns facing students and staff with the elimination of the mask mandate. Our schools are fertile ground for tremendous COVID spread given the low numbers of vaccinated individuals. I believe most of our administrators and teachers feel our schools will now be more unsafe and learning impacted and jeopardized. I urge us all to look up. Thanks, your time's up. Our final speaker this evening is Andrea Nagy. Thank you so much for letting me speak and thank you for thank you so much for volunteer uh, for being here and for the time. Oh is that better? Thank you so much for being here and for the time you're putting to listen to us. I just would like to give a quick fa a fact, uh, everyone here. Um, I just would like to say that the masks have a poor size that range between 80 and 500 microns in size. The diameter of the virus is one micron. So I am a biochemist, not a mathematician. So I let you do the math. <laughs> um, uh, it would be great if the mask and the vaccines could stop the spread of COVID. I would be the first one, you know, advocating to use a mask and I would have been the first one getting a vaccine. But now we are seeing uh, all our friends that had had a vaccine are the ones spreading the virus. Uh, my husband's family, all of them got vaccinated and they all got COVID. 
uh, my sister-in-law didn't know and she went to a concert. So I would guess the vaccines won't stop the virus and the mask won't stop the virus. Um, it would be great. I wish it could. Um, that's all I have to say. And I just want really thank you for protecting parental rights and let every parent decide what's best for the children, either to wear a mask or not. Thank you. Thank you, speakers. It's now time for board comments. We'll start with Ms. Kahn's. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Um, a couple quick notes in relation to, well, Happy New Year, first of all. I want to start it on a positive note. Um, uh, related to briefly what Ms. Harvey mentioned, I was going to um, offer up um, inciting your passion as parents and teachers to please review this uh, curriculum and revisions being put out by the Colorado Department of Education. Just we want to be informed um, folks here in the district. So please know that that's open till February 1st. So you can review all of that. Uh, secondarily, similar, similarly, uh, here at our district, we're reviewing some textbooks. Um, this um, review is open to the public January 10th through the 24th. You can just make an appointment um, anytime between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. So if you want to check that out, please, I encourage all of you and, and let others know that aren't here to um, educate ourselves um, about what our kids are seeing just so we know what's coming up for our children and our students. Um, and then uh, just to read my general comments, um, I think if I can humbly say Ms. Kent and I maybe we're on the same wavelength with what we wanted to talk about today. Um, one of the main reasons I wanted to be more involved in our district in this capacity is because of my immense gratitude for this community of involved parents talented, caring staff, and awesome students. We all have different backgrounds of experience and beliefs, but there is so much in which we can come together to work on to build community and increase academic success. Every one of us has gained wisdom through parenting, teaching, being servant leaders, and I invite, I implore all of you passionate people listening to start brainstorming solutions to achieving these goals. We will, will we be a community of problem oriented or solution oriented people? Can we perhaps build community, build children's acceptance and joy by sending a postcard to students who are absent? Imagine how that child will feel receiving a note that they were missed and their teachers and classmates can't wait to see them. This is just one idea. I'm not sure if it's viable, but if it creates enough positivity, finding a way is worth it. So what are your ideas? What are your creative thoughts and plans to build a hope-filled community, to increase proficiency and love of learning in our students? What are your solutions to foster academic excellence, to meet each student where they're at and show them the hope and goals they can attain? Please continue to be involved to share your passion for the excellent education we offer D20 students. Let's consciously start in our own families, then reach out to our circles, our schools, our community with purpose, with meaning, with hope that we can all actively work together to make each day better than the last. Thank you. Mr. Salt. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It's great to see everyone here. I uh, hope you all had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Um, I had the pleasure of joining the speaker series yesterday. We had um, saw Mr. Lomurray uh, from Sources of Strength uh, come out and speak with many of our, our teachers. I got to interact with them and, and have a great conversation around that. So that was really enjoyable. Um, unfortunately, uh, I missed some previous uh, engagements earlier this uh, at the end of last year, um, but I'm looking forward to this next week. Uh, I'm going to be able to go through and visit all of our all of my schools and uh, kick those introductions off. So I'm really excited to, to meet everyone. Thank you. Ms. Kloniger. <laughs> 
Um, I wasn't going to come tonight because I have felt the um, presence of of uh, this variant, and I am frustrated by um, the numbers as well. But I sent my children to school because I felt like they needed to be in school, and um, so I couldn't be a hypocrite and not come to my own board, board meeting. But that said, um, I'm grateful for um, the opportunity to come and speak tonight and to be part of this board. Um, <clears throat> I last uh, before I went to before we went on break, I went around to all of my schools, including the three that I was trading with Mrs. Khan's um, kind of to say goodbye, but also to just check in on them. Um, and I was able to meet with all of the principals or at least an admin. And it was wonderful to be in the classrooms and, and be in the schools. Um, you know, I find some of this uh, a little bit ironic in that we talk about um, things that we want to be learning, but most of our discussions here are about social issues. And so I just wanted to point out that um, that is truly where my heart is, is to be in the classroom, in the mix with the children doing, you know, being a judge for a science fair or going in and learning something with students out in school in the woods or wherever. Um, so I, I hear you and I recognize um, where things are coming from as far as social emotional, because we as parents certainly take that on. Um, but I just wanted to say that the schools that I went to, which were many, I loved and had an enjoyable time with them. Um, I am looking forward to all of the spring musicals. My son and I were able to go to Hamilton over the Christmas break, which I was um, not in Denver, obviously, because it's not here yet. <laughs> I was in Salt Lake. Um, <clears throat> but m my point in bringing that up is that um, the, I, I well, anyway, if you know the, the play and, 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 and know the music like my son does word for word, um, then you will know of the, um, the passionate conversation that goes around some of those songs about inclusivity and, um, and doing your best and working hard. And that's what um, I encourage my kids and, and all of your kids to do as well. Uh, I also was invited to go to the um, all state choir performance coming up in a couple of weekends from a gal that I go to church with who got in for the third time in a row and is thrilled to be a part of that. And so I look forward to championing our students and your students as we go throughout the rest of this year. I just wanted to say also thank you to our teachers for braving all that you do. And uh, I even have teachers here in this room that I, <laughs> I almost want to make an apology for, <laughs> uh, you know who you are, but um, just thank you for all that you do. So uh, that's all. Mr. Temby. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Um, I too wanted to reference the um, speaker series with Scott Lamar uh, Lamurray, the CEO of Sources of Strength. And I think uh, all of us should be concerned about the issue of social emotional health. I think it's affected um, not just students, but staff and parents over the past uh, couple of years now, almost two years, which is stunning to believe. Um, but he gave an excellent uh, presentation and there was a lot to derive from that uh, presentation. So appreciate the district uh, hosting him and uh, hopefully our staff and other attendees benefited from that session. Uh, we've heard a lot from teachers, uh, particularly as it relates to their social emotional health and uh, fatigue. And just wanted to assure that uh, our teachers are being heard uh, and the board uh, I think is unified in uh, being concerned about your concerns. And so uh, that will continue to be a priority for us uh, because our end statement is that we will prepare all kids for post-secondary success and a huge component of that is our teachers in the classroom helping ensure that not just parents in the home 
but our teachers and our staff. So the board does hear you. So, and that's all I have, Mr. Lavalley. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Sullivan. No comments, no, thank you. Thank you, I have just a few things. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, I too went to, I remotely went to the Sources of Strength speaker series by Scott Lomurray. Lom Lomurray. Um, there was a lot of helpful ideas presented and it appears like it was well attended. You know, they had to, they panned a couple times and looked like there was a, a pretty good crowd, which was really good. I enjoyed that. Um, I got to be a guest lecturer today at Discovery Canyon High School on Mr. Jonathan Bluff's aerospace engineering class, and it was a blast. I fly airplanes for a living, and I got to spend 45 minutes talking about airplanes to kids, so it was really cool. I got to tell them about like how they figured out longitude. If you ever want to know, it's a really fun story. Um, what what a knot is, what a nautical mile is, and, and all those sorts of things. It was really fun. And of course, I got to talk to him about, I literally said, delayed gratification and spend less than you earn, and you will be in good shape if you do that for the rest of your life. I said, I'm probably sounding like your parents, but but it was really good just to kind of speak into kids' lives. And I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna go back tomorrow morning and speak the second section. It was really good. Um, I, I wanna thank TCA generally, and I wanna thank Mr. Bob Swanson specifically for the great Christmas candy. Somebody, I didn't know who it was from, and somebody thanked me, and I went, okay, and, and I, we did not give that out. That was Mr. Swanson from TCA, so I, I apologize. Whoever that was, I forget, but they, they thanked me for it. It wasn't. So, um, and, and I, I too just want to say um, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I always kind of say the teachers are on the pointy end of the sword, and they are so important and so crucial, but also we've got administrators and paras and, and bus drivers and, and custodians. They're all important, and believe me, if you listen to the work session that we had today, we are thinking about you and we are doing whatever we can. Uh, we understand um, we want excellent education for every child. We don't get that without excellent employees. And so it, it, is, it is understood, we're hearing you and, and we're doing whatever we can. So without further ado, administration comments, Dr. Field. Yes, Ms. Kuzer. Thank you, Dr. Field. Um, I am pleased to introduce Zach Mather, and I believe Zach, if you could stand, there he is in the back, um, who is being recommended as the Director for Information Technology Infrastructure Services. Zach holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Information Technology from Columbia Southern University in Orange Beach, Alabama. Nice place. Um, and Zach started in Educational Technology with Harrison School District 2 as a network support, support specialist, network systems administrator, and chief network engineer, as well as supervisor for technology services. He then um, served as the director for information technology in Durango School District 9R. For the past five years, Zach has served as the director for technology for Pueblo City Schools. We are pleased to present Zach to you tonight for the position of Director for Information Technology and Infrastructure Services. Zach, is there anything you would like to say? You can press the podium. Hi, good evening, board. Uh, I just wanted to say I appreciate uh, Ms. Kuzer and the board in this district for this opportunity um, to come work here. I am a D20 product and I have students here or students sorry kids here um, and I'm really excited to get started and uh, join a great great group thanks so before the holiday break the Liberty CTE auto program students stepped up in a big way a young mother and her daughter needed new brakes but couldn't afford the repair the Liberty auto program with help from the Adam and son auto shop fixed her brakes for free because our students paid it forward, this local family is back on the road. Also at Liberty, congratulations, congratulations to the cheer coach, Ariel Preble. She was awarded with the Chassa Virginia Lorbeer Impact Coach Scholarship at the state competition. The award is given to a coach who shows dedication to their program, demonstrates integrity, emphasizes team, and takes the lead in supporting their school and community. In addition to the recognition, Ariel received $1,000. Yes, so at Foothill, Miss Laura Tannehill, and you may have seen this on TV recently, she is a kindergarten teacher at Foothills who was named KOAA's first teacher shout out for 2022. It's a feature they do every month, I think. 
She was nominated by her students for going above and beyond. The KOAA crew stopped in her classroom unannounced, and she was dressed up as Cindy Lou Who from, it's, is it the, the Grinch, yeah. Uh, and she learned of this award and received an oversized $500 check. If you missed the story, you can find it on the district's social media channels. And congratulations to Mrs. Tannehill. At Discovery Canyon High School, three students on the DCC High School speech and debate team were awarded the Academic All-American Award. Fewer than 1% of the 141,000 student members earned this award for showing outstanding academic rigor competitive speech and debate success and personal excellence. So congratulations to Dashita Sharma, Shalina Kudamore, and Hope Shea. And then finally, as many of our board members have mentioned this evening, yesterday was a professional learning day in the district for our teachers and staff. And uh, the Academy Education Foundation is the organization that sponsors our annual speaker series. And we did host Scott Lemurray, who is the CEO from Sources of Strength. So our morning session was held at the Ent Center at UCCS. We do a lot of um, partnering with them and we're down on their campus a lot. So we had um, some attendees in, per in person, but many watched on Microsoft Teams. And then in the afternoon, we had a session at Chinook Trail Middle School. So all in all, we had 868 teachers and administrators participate and three board members. And that's it, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Field. Uh, and speaking of, online remote there are 40 people listening in uh, so that's that's a pretty good number we're going to take it is now uh, 656 we're going to take a five minute break until 701 what no oh, five minute break Oh, go on. Oh, they have. Thank you. 
You are seated. That is awesome. Where's Aaron Salt? All right. That has been five minutes. Thank you. If Zach is still here, I want to apologize to him. All right. We need a Y'all could, um, gonna start again. We need a motion to approve the following resolutions. Resolution 0122, approval of matters related to administrative staff license. Resolution 0222, approval of matters related to administrative staff classified. Resolution 0322, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. Resolution 0422, approval of matters relating to licensed staff license support slash special services provider. Um, resolution 0522, approval of matters relating to classified staff. Resolution 0622, approval of annual ENDS 1.1 knowledge and skills monitoring report. Resolution 07-22, approval of monitoring report evaluation MRE for ENDS policy 1.1 knowledge and skills. Resolution 0822, approval of monitoring report for executive limitations policy EL 2.4, financial conditions and condition and activities. Resolution 0922, approval of monitoring report Evaluation MRE for Executive Limitations Policy 2.4 Financial Condition and Activities. Resolution 1022 Approval of 2223 New Course Proposals from Air Academy High School, Discovery Canyon Campus High School, Liberty High School, Pine Creek High School, Rampart High School, and Village High School. Resolution 1122 Approval of 2223 Career and Technical Education Secondary Pathways Program. Resolution 1222 Approval of Annual Designation of Education and Administrative Center EAC as place for posting public notice to public uh, meetings and approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from December 9th, 2021. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. There are no items pulled from the consent agenda. Uh, next one is the annual monitoring report for policy EL 2.9 communication and support of, uh, to the board. Dr. Field. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Tonight we are pleased to present the annual monitoring report for EL 2.9 communication and support to the board. In summary, the 10 provisions of this executive limitation ensure board members have the information needed to make timely and informed decisions, avoid surprises, and lead the district effectively and efficiently by expecting the superintendent to present annual monitoring reports in a timely, accurate, and an understandable format, provide the board with information requested and information needed to make well-informed decisions, make the board aware of pending legal issues, media coverage, and material organizational changes, make the board aware of any adverse stakeholder reaction to potential decisions, actions, policies, procedures, or practices, inform the board of any potential non-compliance with board policy by either the board or staff, update the board on the disposition of complaints brought to the board, provide reasonable administrative support to the board to allow effective and efficient governance, and support holism in the board, accurately represent board processes and role, and assure the board meets its legal obligations. As you have the full written report, we will not go through each of the many pages with you. However, I would like to highlight a few items. First, I believe that the board is adequately informed and supported in its work. Through the board meetings, work sessions, regular emails, and phone calls, the superintendent does his best to keep the board informed of important and relevant information, issues, and decisions. 
He also uses the board planning calendar to make sure the board receives identified information in the month stated on the calendar, including all monitoring reports. Additionally, the board is provided with information not identified on the planning calendar, but is relevant and timely during the year. The superintendent assists the board president in planning board agendas and often suggests additions to the board's meeting agenda for informational and legal purposes. As you can see from the details of the report, monitoring reports were presented timely, board questions were addressed, decision-making information was presented, administrative support to the board was provided, recommendations from staff were offered as appropriate, and legal obligations were met. The past year was a very challenging year with many opportunities for discussions and decisions. COVID presented unique circumstances, creating numerous occasions for discussion, debate, and course correction. Through it all, the board was kept informed and was able to provide input. That is a quick summary of the 15-page report, and I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Seeing none, I will do the MRE. Is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable? Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance? Concerns regarding performance? Okay. Next uh, up is 11B. Resub oh, let me finish the questions. Um, would you like to see additional? Thank you. Ms. Matson's going to keep me honest. Would you like to see additional or different evidence or formatting changes in the next monitoring report cycle? Do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? Are there any areas we would like to learn more about prior to the presentation of the next monitoring report cycle? And are there linkage needs the board should address? Do you see any, do you see the need for any part of this policy to be changed? Thank you. Now we can go on to resubmission of monitoring report for policy EL 2.3 treatment of staff, specifically provision 2.3.7 uh, that says the superintendent will not allow staff to be unprepared to deal with emergency situations. Um, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. LaValle. This is the resubmission of the monitoring report for EL 2.3, specifically item EL 2.3.7, that the superintendent will not allow staff to be unprepared to deal with emergency situations. In a prior board meeting on October 7, 2021, this report was presented and it was inaccurate. The cause for the inaccuracy lies squarely on my shoulders as the COO. There were changes in positions, changes in personnel, and misunderstandings as to the timeline by which this report was given. Specifically, when the report was given, it covered the period July of 21 to October of 21. That was the understanding. Whereas the report should have covered the period of September of 20 through October of 21. It should have reflected the prior year. I think it was uh, just stated uh, in the by Dr. Field, last year was the most disruptive year in our profession. I can attest to this as being a principal and someone who was accountable to be a part of this reporting process from a school perspective. And I can tell you that we were at fault as well as we have gone back and looked at the documentation of how the information was collected, who was responsible for collecting that information and collaborating with schools and principals, where the information was contained. And with that, we have put together a number of improvements so that this does not happen again. Specifically, the first thing that needed to happen was training for new personnel to understand board governance policy, the reporting of executive limitations, and what the board end statements are. That training was completed by the new personnel. It was given by Dr. Jim Smith, who basically gave us a 
board governance policy, professional learning opportunity to understand the purpose and why the timelines are the way that they are. Next, we looked at how the information was collected within the security department. That information was collected um, historically by a classified employee. Now, now, quite possibly in the way that we have done it, it may have been um, in any crisis bound to fail, but we had always done it like that and we placed a classified employee in the wrong position to collect, maintain, and report that information. What has changed is security still collects that information. However, the person responsible for that is the director for security who collaborates and works with our PSSGs who supervise principals and with the principals themselves around drill schedules. We have outlined where some of the failures occurred with regard to drills that have to be conducted in certain time periods, the first 10 days of the school year. We always know we have to have a December fire drill and there is likely only 10 days to get that done. We have redone those timelines to be more specific for when schools will conduct those drills. We have also outlined a better process for coming back after the new year changes of when we will do tornado drills and our shelter drills to specifically meet the timelines that we want to have. In essence, what we found is we had schools doing tornado drills in December because they had to get it done. It was a let's get that done by December when where we really need to do tornado drills is in August and September and once again in March. April and May, we need to ensure that those drills are done before that. That monitoring and checks and balances is in, is in place now with security. It's been briefed to our PSSGs and our principals as well to know that this corrective action is now in place so that we hopefully do not make the same mistakes. Again, this would fall squarely on my shoulders as a chief operating officer and not catching this prior to that report being given to Mr. Gregory who presented it to you and said he was in compliance. The result of the updated report that is submitted now, the result of that is that the superintendent was not in compliance with EL 2.3.7 and that's what it says. With that, I will take your questions. Ms. Uh I just want to say that I appreciate that you and um, Mr. Payne put that like, like figured that out because that was an oversight uh, having that person be in charge of people that were not under her purview per se. So I, I really I understand that and I just I, I thank you because I think that was a great catch and um, it's why we say that you're you know he's in compliance because we know that he is to the best of his knowledge and when something comes up we take responsibility and we rectify the problem so thank you you're very welcome i i do want to be on record as saying that she is a wonderful and incredible and absolutely amazing employee who just was simply faced in a time of crisis we should have caught that sure a, a it was time. not that about was her us, yeah so. absolutely i agree mr salt uh, I would also like to just echo Ms. Cloninger's comments and thank you for, for bringing this up. I like the timeline that you guys laid out. It makes a lot of sense and so I appreciate the fact that you guys have put a lot of thought in, into that to make sure that it's going to give the best benefit to our district. So thank you for that. Well, I like seeing leadership accepting responsibility. I appreciate that. And my big thing was, OK, we goofed. Have we have we fixed what caused the goof? And from what I'm hearing is yes, yes, we have changed procedures and policies, so we will make sure this doesn't happen again. I, I am I am satisfied. And and, and I want to I want to say that it, we we owe it to people catching that mistake and bringing it to our attention. And there is nothing wrong with with catching a mistake and pointing this out and saying how will we move forward and be better. I have often said, Mr. Lavalley, I reserve the right to be smarter tomorrow than I was yesterday. <laughs> That's a good thing. I don't know who quoted that, sir, but somebody did. <laughs> And how many how many school buildings in Colorado have been hit by tornadoes in the last 20 years? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't go there. Thank you. December 15th was really close. It was a lot of wind, no doubt. My my senior year at the academy, 1982, we had 105 mile an hour winds. All the cars got sandblasted. That's 
but I remember that very well because my car was one of the ones that got sandblasted. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, next one is the annual monitoring report for governance process uh, policy, 4.6 board officers roles, Mr. Temby. And, and Will has uh, had some struggle with his voice. So uh, Mr. Temby, if, if just say the word and I can, I can take over for you if, if your voice gives out. Well, I'll sure try, Mr. Lavalley. <clears throat> and if you'll indulge me, we do have to go through four uh, reviews of board compliance to uh, governance process policies tonight. And in each case, the monitoring period was from December 16th, 2020 to December 17th, 2021. The first GP is GP 4.6 regarding board officer roles. This policy refers to the roles of the president, vice president, and treasurer of the Board of Education. The policy delineates the role of each officer and their respective responsibilities. Evidence used to determine compliance was Board of Education meeting agendas, debriefing notes, and Board of Education meeting minutes. Further, Superintendent Tom Gregory has verified that the board members are in compliance with this policy and that letter is attached to this report. In my opinion, that we are in my opinion, we are in compliance for this policy for the period monitored. Questions or comments? Okay, the MRE is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy. Nope. One. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance. Um, concerns regarding performance. Would you like to see additional different evidence or formatting changes in the next monitoring report cycle? You see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary. Are there any areas you would like to learn more about prior to presentation of the next monitoring report cycle? Are there linkage needs the board should address? Or do you see the need for any part of this policy to be changed? Thank you. Next one is uh, annual monitoring report for governance process policy 4.10 board members code of conduct. Mr. Temby. Yes, thank you. This is a very important policy regarding the conduct of all members of the Board of Education to include ethics, lawful conduct, proper use of authority and decorum. <clears throat> Major and notable points in this policy state Board of Education members will represent and serve the citizens of the entire school district. This accountability to the whole district supersedes a any conflicting loyalty a member may have to other advocacy or interest groups b loyalty based upon membership on other boards or staffs and c conflicts based upon the personal interest of any board of education member who is also a parent of a student district d conflicts based upon being a relative of an employee of the district. Another key point is Board of Education members will recognize the importance of their community leadership roles and shall not allow their conduct to endanger the district's public image, credibility, or ability to accomplish its ends. Another key point is Board of Education members may not attempt to exercise individual authority over the organization. And the last key area is to build trust among members to ensure an environment conducive to effective governance. And then there are several points under that that are uh, important as part of the policy. And lastly, this policy addresses communications, adherence to Colorado Sunshine Laws, confidentiality of sensitive legal information, and willingness to go through background checks as necessary. Evidence to determine compliance was Board of Education meeting agendas, debriefing notes, video recordings, and meeting minutes. In my opinion, we are in compliance with this policy for the period monitor. Questions or comments, board? I will just say that, that I, I agree with Mr. Temby. This is very important. We have always had a very good, um, uh, we've gotten along well, even if we disagree on this board, and, and I have every expectation that, that will continue. Um, is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance. Concerns regarding performance. Would you like to see additional or different evidence or formatting changes in the next monitoring report cycle? 
Do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? Are there any areas you would like to learn more about prior to presentation of the next monitoring report cycle? And are there linkage needs the board needs should address? Do you see the need for any part of this policy to be changed? Next one is uh, annual monitoring report for governance process policy 4.11 board member conflict of interest. This policy is straightforward. It states Board of Education members are expected to avoid conf conflicts of interest involving any matter pending before the board. A conflict of interest is deemed to exist when a member is confronted with an issue in which the member has a personal or financial interest or an issue or circumstance that could render the member unable to devote complete loyalty and singleness of purpose to the public interest. Further, should a board member believe they have a conflict of interest, they are required to disclose that conflict to the board and recuse themselves from voting on that issue or influencing other board members. There is no evidence that any viola violations have occurred with GP 4.11. Further, Ms. Becky Allen, Chief Financial Officer, and Mr. Cameron Smart, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, have provided a signed statement verifying that the Board of Education is compliant with GP 4.11. It is my opinion that we are in compliance with this policy for the period monitor. Board questions, comments? Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Concerns regarding performance. Would you like to see additional or different evidence or formatting changes in the next monitoring report cycle? Uh, I had a, uh, one thought on that is I know we all sign forms uh, stating that we don't have a conflict of interest. Is that something that should be considered as evidence? I didn't see that on this particular. Um, That's a great question. Mr. Temby, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I think that's an excellent point. That would absolutely uh, qualify as uh, tangible and concrete evidence of, of uh, a board's uh, avowing to no conflict of interest. So what if uh, we say would like to add um, the conflict of interest forms that were signed um, when seated? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good, great point. Are there any areas you would like to learn more about prior to presentation of the next monitoring report cycle? Are there linkage needs the board should address? Do you see any need? Do you see the need for any part of this policy to be changed? Very good. And you have one more. Annual, annual monitoring report for governance process policy 4.12 process for addressing board member violations. This brief policy is about board members compliance to board governing policies. It also enumerates the process the board would take should there be a perceived non-compliance issue with a member. Evidence of compliance are meeting agendas, meeting minutes, video recordings, and debriefing notes. After reviewing all the evidence, there is no indication that the Board of, uh, board of Education is out of compliance with any section of this policy. The Board of Education continues to do a good job in operating within the parameters described in the executive limitations and by observing the board superintendent relationships and governance policies. Thank you, Mr. Tembe. Board, any questions or comments? Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Are there concerns regarding performance? Would you like to see additional or different evidence or formatting changes in the next monitoring report cycle? Do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? Are there any areas you would like to learn more about prior to presentation of the next monitoring report cycle? Are there linkage needs the board should address? Do you see the need for any part of this policy to be changed? Thank you, Mr. Temby. I'll just say that this comes across as somewhat boring and mundane, which is a good thing. That means that this board, I, I believe, does a, a good job of staying in its lane. We do a good job of making sure that we don't have any conflicts of interest. We make sure that we get along well. And, and I like boring reports like this. That means that we are, are doing, I believe, what we should be doing. Thank you. 
All right, next uh, superintendent reports, tracking graduates, Dr. Field. Dr. Smith. All right, good evening. I need to adjust the uh, microphone after Mr. Smith. <laughs> All right, thank you for the opportunity to share this year's uh, tracking graduate uh, update. Um, next slide, please. This process has been in place since 2013 after the uh, superintendent at the time asked that we begin looking at where our graduates go after completing high school. So after that, receiving that charge, we then partnered with the National Student Clearinghouse and they, in partnership with us, uh, collect data from many um, uh, institutions across the country and then we work together to uh, present or create the presentation that you're going to see tonight. Next slide, please. All right, the past year and a half has been challenging, as many people have said, in a variety of ways, and the impact was apparently felt by the National Student Clearinghouse as well, who published a full explanation and correction of their initial 2020 report. The data which I used to create this report last year was reportedly missing approximately 50% of the data from the typical data set. The oversight by the Clearinghouse resulted in a skewed reporting of the data, impacting all who used the data to analyze and report on matriculation trends. If you recall, I even uh, utilized an NPR story that used that same data. So I think many of us are thinking that was really a tough, tough situation. So next slide, please. So this is their full statement. Um, our preliminary results have been updated with the addition of approximately 50% more data from high schools and colleges and restated to correct a process error. The error resulted in an overestimate of the rate of decline in college enrollment counts. Next slide, please. So this is a slide that you recall from last year. It caused us lots of concern and we began wondering what happened? Well, what, where are all the students? And so uh, I then embarked upon uh, collecting qualitative research and data from students and staff and parents. And uh, we came up with a lot of different ideas of what might have been the cause of this. But uh, frankly, in the end, uh, the results, as you'll see tonight, aren't quite as dire. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, what, that, what does this mean for us? It means that the results aren't quite as bad, as tough as we initially thought. Um, but we did receive a lot of thoughts from students and parents about their experiences during the pandemic and they're thinking about the future and they're thinking about college and the impact there. Next slide, please. All right, so this really is our data for this year. And you can see there's no giant dip from last year. Um, so it does look a little bit more reasonable. Just to give a little bit of background, the data that we're looking at here is um, inclusive of most institutions across the country. It's, it does exclude about 5% of the universities and colleges who do not participate in the data collection, as well as uh, military um, students who went to the military or military academies. So we don't have that data included here either. One other group that's not included would be uh, trade schools that do not identify as community colleges. So with that, we'll dig into the data and we have a few slides of that. So when we look at the percentages of students who enrolled in college immediately after high school in 2020, we had 65% of the total 1,776 seniors attend either a two-year or a four-year school. As you can see, 65% is below the eight-year average of 70% and will be something to keep an eye on over the years, especially uh, with, since we have had three consecutive years below that average. The interpretation of immediately after college and just so you know, is an enrollment window of August 15th through October 31st. So when comparing our performance to national averages shared by the National Clearinghouse, our percentages fare okay against the reported 61% for urban districts, 66% for suburban districts, and 60% for rural districts. While there's been a multi-year trend of decreased enrollment at higher institutions, District 20s dropped from 73% in 2017 to 65% in 2020, an 8% decrease over the past four years is more rapid than the national average. Just something to keep an eye on. Interestingly, over the past six years, we've seen a national trend of fewer students enrolling in higher education, specifically in four-year institutions. Possible causes include the cost of college and the question about the actual return on investment as well as the increase in jobs that do not require a four or two year degree. Next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna start breaking it down. When we look at in-state versus out-of-state enrollments, 
the in-state institutions are showing the consistent year after year decrease with out of state remaining relatively steady at 22%. Next slide, please. When analyzing public schools versus private, we see a more sustained decrease over time with public institutions rather than private institutions. Next slide, please. Making sure I'm on track here. I can't quite see the graph from here. <laughs> this graph shows a breakdown of four year versus two year schools. Interestingly, two year schools continue to remain consistent, relatively unchanged year after year. Possible uh, explanation for that could be cost and access um, or stability, which we can see uh, nationwide as well. Four year schools show a greater impact on the decreases in enrollment that we have seen over the past three to four years from 58% in 2016 to 50% in 2020. Next slide, please. All right. So this is the same uh, kind of data set, but looking at students in the first year. Hold on for a second. Catch my breath for a second. Going a little lightheaded. Just for a second. Yeah, relax. Does anybody else want to cover this? Dr. Field? Just need a drink of water. So the percentage of students enrolled in college during the first year after high school, or August to August, increases slightly from 65% to 69%. Thank you, Christian. However, the three-year trend of being below eight-year average remains consistent. Next slide, please. Much like we saw earlier, in-state is impacted more than out-of-state over time, but both saw 2% decreases when compared to the previous year. When examined more closely, the drop is evident in both public and private institutions, with a slightly greater impact with private schools, but nothing drastically outside the norm. Next slide, I think I'm one ahead. Next slide, please. Okay. Here we're looking at four-year versus two-year institutions. Similarly, the overall decrease in enrollments is most evident with the four-year institutions, much like what we saw before. Next slide. All right, now we're looking at the percentage of students enrolled in college first year after high school. Um, and this hey, is the persistent. Oh, so, yes. Why don't you finish from sitting down at you? Seriously, if you, if you want to continue, that's fine. Just sit down, sit down over there. You, we'll turn on your mic and you can do it there. There's no reason for you to stand up here. Sorry about that. So what we're seeing in this slide here is persistence data. This describes the percentage of students who stayed in college from their freshman year to their sophomore year. This graph shows that the 100% of students who attended college, 80% of the 100 students who attended college, 86% of the students persisted to their second year. This data includes both two-year and four-year institutions. This is a one percentage point increase over the last year, but is 1% below the, the seven-year average. The persistence percentage nationally fares as follows. Urban, 83%, suburban, 87%, and rural, 82%. At 86%, we're just under the national average for suburb suburban schools, but ahead of urban and rural schools by far. Just as a reminder, since we're looking at persistence from freshman to sophomore year, we'll talk, we're talking about the graduating class of 2019 and prior. Next slide, please. When we break it down by in-state versus out-of-state, while the overall percentage of students persisting remained mostly unchanged for both groups, the gap has widened by about one percentage point a question could be asked about the reasoning for the widening gap between in-state versus out-of-state. One theory is that the level of commitment to an out-of-state is higher or could possibly impact scholarship opportunities for, to access specialized programs outside of the state. Next slide, please. 
When we look at public versus private, interestingly, among these students, the gap between public and private schools with respect to persistence, the gap has once again widened to 4% when compared to the previous year. Next slide, please. Persistence is highest among students enrolled at the four year institution and two year schools saw a 5% rebound um, from 2018 to 2019. This is highly unusual in my opinion because two year schools tend to be very con consistent year after year. But it'll be interesting to watch to see if we'll see some changes at the uh, two year or community college level. Next slide, please. Now we're getting to really colorful slides. To look at the six year completion rates, we have to go back in time for the three classes, 2013, 2014, and 2015. District 20 averages 52% of students enrolled in college graduate within six years, which is very consistent year after year. Nationally, 37% of students graduated from urban high schools completed in six years, 47 from suburban high schools and 41% from rural schools. When comparing the national averages for completion within six years, D20 is faring very well. What does this mean? It could mean that when compared to national trends, our students are better prepared to attend and persevere in school. This data does not include both, this data does include both two-year and four-year programs. If a student completes an associate degree in the first two years, or in two years, they are included in the completion data at the same, at that time, even if they continue to complete a BA or BS in the future. The first degree earned is what is recorded. Next slide, please. All right. A lot of more colors here. So to orient ourselves, the purple band, the top band, represents students who captured in the are captured in the data set are not captured in the data set with the National Clearinghouse. This band could include high school graduates not attending any institution or attending an institution that does not report data to the clearinghouse or military or military academies. You will note that there is a 3.3% drop in the purple band from 2013 to 2014, but you will also recognize that the green, new to college, changed to 3.2% from 75.4. This is expected as most students in the green band will either persist or leave college. The yellow band represents no longer enrolled and not graduated. This number does increase over time from 9.5% in 2014 to 22.8% in 2020. This is an area that I think does illuminate possible questions for us to ponder, like why are so many students choosing to drop out of college once they've started? Is there something we could do better to prepare or guide these students going into college? Or do we have enough programs for students who really don't want to go to college? The orange band, or the persistence band, decreases over time as students either graduate or they leave, um, or they leave college, the yellow band. The magenta band represents students who have graduated. The 2020, the 2013 had 56.8% of its students um, graduated by the end of the 2020-2021 school year. Next slide, please. This graph provides a seven-year perspective of the 2014 graduating class and their enrollments and progress over time. As you see, the percentages of each year are based on 100% of the total number of students from the graduating class. The class of 2014 had 1,569 graduates. By 2020, 2021, 868 students graduated, 52.8%, and 329 students dropped out of college. That equals 21%. Of particular interest to me is to see the new college, to, the new to college students over time, the green band as well as students who return to college after taking some time off, the turquoise band. Next slide, please. Similarly, this graph tracks the graduating class of 2015 over a six year period of time. When compared to the previous classes, the class of 2015 stacks out very similarly. The total enrollment for this class was 1,673. By the end of the 2020-21 school year, 863 students or 51.6% graduated from college. Next slide, please. This graph tracks the class of 2016 over a five-year period. This class is slightly below the previous two classes with respect to the percentage of students, 46.9% or 767 students, that graduated from college at the five-year mark. This class's size was 1,635. 
Next slide, please. The class of 2017 is on track to perform much like the previous classes with a total enrollment of 1,661. At the four year mark, the class of 2017 has 558 graduates or 33.6 of the students in the class of 2017. Next slide, please. As we get closer to the current year, as you can see, the data is a bit less interesting, but at this point I want to highlight the purple band, the percentage of students not accounted for in the National Student Clearinghouse. The class of 2018 has 28.14% in the first year. You'll see in the second, in a second, the class of 2020 has 31.1% unaccounted for, or in a two or four, for a two or four year institution. This is most compelling when compared to the class of 2013, which we looked at earlier, which had 24% of the class in this category. That is a 7% percentage point difference, and the percentage has been growing each year, indicating that fewer D20 students are attending college. Again, cost and access to high paying entry level jobs are two possible variables that could explain this trend. Next slide, please. This is the class of 2019. 1,678 students, a smaller total enrollment than the class of 2018 by one by 155. Next slide, please. And the class of 2020 with the enrollment of 1,776 has the largest percentage of unaccounted for students as well as, and directly related to, the lowest percentage of new to college at 68.8%. When compared to the class of 2013, the class of 2020 has nearly 7% or 124 fewer students attending college. Next slide, please. All right, this is everyone's favorite table, I think. It's, this is a table that represents the top 25 institutions that our graduates, our graduates most commonly enroll in following graduation. As you know, I like to point out the um, Ivy League School of the Midwest or the University of Kansas at number 25. <laughs> Rock chalk, anybody? Okay. Two schools that return to the top 25 include Baylor at number 18 and North, Northern Arizona University at number 24. Interestingly, Alabama stayed in the top 25. Montana State at, at Bozeman in their third year finds themselves in the top 25 at number 17. I'm also proud to announce that K-State, Kansas State, did not make the top 25 once again this year. <laughs> Just so we know. The University of Nebraska-Lincoln fell out of the top 25 and Grand Canyon moved from 16 to number 9. All right. In a very consistent fashion, the schools at the top of the list were most attended by D20 students include Pikes Peak Community College, UCCS, CSU, CU Boulder, and the University of Northern Colorado, respectively. Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? Board questions? Mr. Salt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, for your report. Um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time because I know you covered this and I completely missed it. No, you're good. Um, <clears throat> back on page seven, you had the graph that showed that the, the district a or yeah, the district average was 70% um, graduation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's the graph there. Which one? Oh, yeah. Um, what was the national average? Yeah, so we're talking about the percentage of students enrolled in college immediately following high school. Yes, right? yes, yes. Yeah. So at the for the urban districts, that's 61 percent, suburban districts, 66 percent and rural districts is fit as 60 percent. OK, thank you. Um, so we're at 65 percent there. Perfect. So um, then on Page 18, I know, I know we talked about this. I just wanted to call it out that that it was just so interesting um, how much lower the two-year retention is versus the four-year retention. That's something that there's a lot of factors that play into that that I would have expected that number to be reversed, that we would have had higher retention in two years than in four years. Um, I was curious, I guess, uh, does the data here reflect students who would have moved from a two-year to a four-year university, or would that have considered persistent or not since they exactly if you look at persistence data it would count them they would stay in the data set if they move from a two year to a four year however when we're looking at completion rates so that's a whole different thing sure yeah okay um thank you and then another question that uh came up for me that i didn't send ahead of time so i oh, apologize um I, I noticed so we have what is it eight years i think from that initial um group in 2013 2014 uh, is there a max cap on the longitudinal nature of this data? Are we going to 
report it perpetually? What is sort of that that cap? Good question. So we have been reporting this since 2013, right? So we have a lot of data in the previous, but we just looking into the future, it's been a report that has been requested for many years. Um, I think it's been interesting to see just overall the changes in the number of students attending college. And I think it does drive the question of, um, are we responding to what the needs of are for our students and their families in terms of providing the right programming? No, I think this is a fantastic uh, data set for us to look at. And really, like you said, it really helps us understand what what we're doing and what those trends are and how we can better prepare students. Um, you know, I'm not to, to keep adding things to, to do, but um, the, the longitudinal nature of this I find fascinating, especially when you start looking at, uh, I know, so I started a community college before I went to a, to a four-year school. And I would go in uh, night classes because it's way better for me. Uh, and, and I would be in there with uh, with adults who are returning to to college who had never gone before. And so I think it might be interesting, you know, not that we need to do this for 20 years, but you know what that looks like in 20 years that we still have people that are still new, uh, new enrollees coming into college. But right. I don't know, it's just it's fascinating data. So I thank you for much. Yeah, no, I think and there's there, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, we now have different uh, kind of data analytics and tools that we can use like Tableau. That would allow us to pull data from infinite campus to look at things like um, how are students um, in uh, AP classes doing, students who are in the IB programming, um, students who have taken CTE classes. Um, how does that impact overall? You know their their uh, um, persistence and performance in, in college. For sure, you're speaking my language. Thank you. Yeah. It's a lot more work though. <laughs> work for you. Yes, Mr. Lavalley, I've got a question. Yes, Mr. Temby. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Um, a couple of questions. Um, does the National Student Clearinghouse um, analyze any of this data, or is this just as you receive the data, we analyze that, you know, for for district only? Um, the reason I'm asking is having their macro view of things, particularly as you look at 2020. You know, I, I pay two college tuitions right now, and uh, I'll be honest, I've bristled a little bit at uh, kind of the online learning environment uh, with no concession to that tuition. Um, so it doesn't surprise me as we look at 2020 data where there might be a drop in people's attending and the perceived value of that higher education. So. Uh, more comment slash question, but just would like kind of your thoughts on all that. Yeah, so your initial question was, do we do the data crunching in, in essence, or do they uh, do that? They, the current reports that we have, they provide that data analysis, um, and that's something that we've done in partnership with them to say, what do we want and how do we want it to look? And then they kind of take it from there. Yeah. If we were to go further looking at, like I was describing, AP, IB, CTE, those kinds of things we could use the raw data to run that in uh, in conjunction with what we have in infant campus yeah great but i do think i mean you were talking about the cost of college just kind of shooting from the hip here i think it is it's one of those um, hurdles for families to overcome yeah particularly as many of them have gone to either hybrid or remote models um, throughout this pandemic um, it's making people really um, look at that investment um, a little bit more uh, closely, I think so. And again, that's an anecdotal comment for me, but um, so, but uh, like Mr. Salt said, it's uh, great da data, great uh, data to look at. And uh, I enjoy looking at it on a longitudinal basis. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Smith. I got a, just a couple of comments. Sure. <clears throat> I, I still can't believe they don't include Service Academy cadets and midshipmen i know give me a break how hard could that be maybe and we their can college have someone students. apply pressure yeah I, I just think it's yeah inexcusable um but uh and i'm guessing 15 to 20 a year out of our district go to service academies that's, that's about what we use as a kind of a, a ballpark figure for sure yeah do do we throw that in here or not we no because it's not a, an official number yeah it, it it only changed the data like two percent or so um and so you said 52% of our of our high school graduates from D20 graduate from a four year college after six years. Um, that tells me just how important CTE is and how important it is that we teach our children critical thinking, mathematics, 
science, the, how to live in, in, in life, if you will. Okay. And I think that's so important, those life skills that we, that we teach, a love of English, a love of reading, all those things, um, I, I, just, I just think it's so important. Yes, college prep is important, no doubt. But when you look at 52, 48% of our children will not graduate from a four-year college. That's right. Um, and, and then I, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I've really thought about this a lot. Um, the percentage of children going to college is, is not very high and it drops. Is, is that a bad news story? If it's because the, the children don't think that they can perform, yes, because that means we didn't, we didn't teach our children well. If it's because they don't think they need it, they think it, you know, there's a lot of people out there who say, you know, why are you going to college? They're going to, you know, you're going to brainwash, whatever. And there's, a, there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I struggle with seeing a, a drop in college admission as necessarily a bad news story. I don't know if you guys have thought about that. Um, it depends on what they do and it depends on why they're not, not pursuing college. If they say, you know, I don't start my, my own business and I want to be an entrepreneur or I want to go and I want to be an auto mechanic. I, those are great things. And I think uh, it's it's not a bad thing. You know, we always think in terms of four-year college degree is, is the gold standard. And, and, and perhaps in some respects it is, but in other respects, you know what? There's a lot of things out there that, that don't require a four-year degree. So just, right. just a thought of if you guys have, have any comments. Aaron, you get. Um, yeah, and that's sort of, uh, I think, part of what we were talking about when we say, you know, how that pro how we're preparing students, right? If we see that trend going down and, and really understanding where those numbers are going and, you know, where they're kind of being filtered off to, if you will, and why they're going. And so that gives us better information on how we can better prepare students. Because if we start seeing that trend drop, even below 50% are going to, you know, graduating college within six years, then that shifts our focus of what, what we're considering ready at graduation. Right, it's that the students in the purple band that I was showing in that last slide there. And, you know, we do have robust certification programs in District 20, I think that's part of it. You know, students are saying, wow, I can get certified in this area, um, you know, cybersecurity being one, and get into the marketplace right away and start making a lot more money than other pro or other uh, professions that require a four or two year degree. Great, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, next up is um, Thanks. District Update, Dr. Field. Hi, yes, thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Tonight we provide an update on district activities to the board and community at the halfway point in school year. So the first semester of the 21-22 school year has been another very challenging semester as a result of the continued impact of COVID. We have learned how to we have learned how important and impactful public education is in our community of students, staff, and parents. More importantly, we have learned how vital in-person learning is to both students and teachers. We must continue to work together in the best interest of students as we begin our fifth semester in a pandemic. Together, we must also support our teachers, staff, and administrators as they are on the front lines each day and often face staffing shortages which require creativity, flexibility, and patience. But even with the many challenges we face, there have been many successes here in District 20. And I wanted to start a little bit backwards at the end of last school year in May of 2021 with our graduation. So we were able to effectively honor our class of 2021 with in-person graduations in perfect weather in an outdoor setting. Although somewhat restricted, graduations were a success and very much appreciated by both graduates and their guests. In August of 2021, Encompass Heights Elementary School opened their doors to students for the first time. Before it was Encompass Heights, we used to refer to the school as Elementary 21. The new school has a state-of-the-art STEM lab and also provides therapy to students who have characteristics of dyslexia. And remember, this was the last school built from the 2016 bond election. Through the first semester, we witnessed students re-engaging with ath athletic seasons, choir concerts, theater performances, and band competitions with, in with tremendous enthusiasm and excitement. The opening of school included more energy than ever before. Students were passionate about returning to school, being with friends, and learning together. Certainly, there have been disruptions, disagreements, and even protests through the first semester. However, it is important to know that even with the distraction of COVID, we continue to focus on improving our education system. This year, schools and departments re-engaged in site planning processes, and schools welcome back external review teams to provide important feedback on programming and educational effectiveness. 
First semester also saw the opening of our new Family Resource Center located at the campus of Academy Endeavor Elementary School. The center provides food and clothing for District 20 families in need and includes a counseling center staffed by four counselors who meet with students on a referral basis to address a variety of mental health issues. All activities of the center have been funded so far by the ESSER grant. The District Technology Advisory Committee, or DTAC, was reestablished this fall and includes an expanded membership of 67 voices. Selected members have an opportunity to share how students and other stakeholders experience the use of technology to support learning and give input on future plans. In support of the strategic plan initiative to enhance student voice in the district, more students are participating on the committee than ever before. And I believe Ms. Kuzer said she selected students at all three levels, elementary, middle, and high. The district's COVID response team was also reactivated during the first semester to, to provide guidance to school administration, assure compliance with health department requirements, and continually revise the district's response protocols. Recognizing the shortage of guest staff, the district established a financial incentive to attract and retain both certified and classified guest staff. Wages were increased and incentives were created for recurring job acceptance. Additionally, the district organized and held a job fair in November to address vacant positions. 106 candidates attended the fair and 13 positions were filled as a result. Our HR staff is planning to host a recurring, a second recurring fair for both licensed and classified positions this coming March. Last spring, a task force was convened to review the district calendar with specific focus on school start and end times designated professional learning community or PLC times and inclement weather days. The task force recommendation for inclement weather days was adapted and implemented earlier this school year. Now we're just waiting for some snow. The recommendation for designating PLC time was to calendar no more than two late starts or an early release each month consistently across all schools and levels, but not before getting feedback from the community. A survey to receive feedback from the community is currently open and I believe it closes today. And once feedback is analyzed, the recommendation can be modified to reflect community needs. Lastly, regarding school start end times, the task force recommended establishing a committee with a singular focus and sufficient time to study start and end times, evaluate the research and understand all implications. This committee was formed and began meeting in November. We also met tonight before this meeting. In support of a superintendent initiative and recognizing that the current student registration process has not been fully evaluated and updated in many years, a small leadership team has explored existing consultants who are experts in this area. A consulting firm has been selected to gather information and provide feedback and other relevant data about our current process and identified areas of needed change. The goal is to improve the experience of our families, improve efficiencies, expedite the enrollment process, and reduce duplication of effort. Since the fall of 2019, Academy District 20 has engaged numerous stakeholders in developing a strategic plan to provide guidance for the district over the next five to 10 years. The plan was finalized in the summer of 2021. This past fall, the strategic plan was shared with the District 20 staff and four strategic objective teams were formed and have begun working on their respective objectives. A comprehensive rollout plan has been developed and is currently being implemented. A full strategic plan update will be provided to the Board of Education at the January 20, 2022 board meeting, so our next board meeting. In response to the superintendent's strategic initiative to review current resource allocation, a committee was established to review current practices around allocating building rental revenue. Our CFO, Becky Allen, and our Chief Operating Officer, Brett Smith, are leading this charge. Specifically, the charge of the committee was to develop a building rental system that improves the fairness of building rental fiscal resources for all District 20 schools, because not all schools have the opportunity to generate building rental revenue. Using the collaborative input model, a building rental resource allocation committee was formed and included representation from principals, licensed and classified staff from each level, parents, DEI task force members, and directors for facilities, contracting, and risk management. The committee has met five times, suggesting and reviewing a variety of scenarios, 
and recommendations are being prepared for submission to the superintendent. Acting on another superintendent initiative, this fall structured and facilitated strand meetings were initiated. These meetings offer a time scheduled monthly for principals in each strand. So a strand, for example, is the Rampart strand or Discovery Canyon. Um, to meet and discuss programming in each school and interaction between levels to discuss strengths and areas for improvement regarding academic preparedness and the continuity of programs. Each meeting is facilitated by a PSSG member, PSSG meaning principal, supervisory, and support group. These strand meetings will continue to develop to improve communication, understanding, knowledge, and academic performance across the levels. And lastly, we continue to make progress in the building fund program. All new schools have been completed and have welcomed students. Additions at three high schools are complete and all facilities have received upgrades in compliance with resolution 205-16. Several projects are in various stages of planning, including, including the construction of a third district, is it natatorium? Yes, natatorium and improvements to the lighted athletic field or stadium at Pine Creek High School. As last reported in November, approximately 85% of bond proceeds have been encumbered or expended, representing approximately $235 million. Approximately 15% representing 40 million are assigned to future projects and board contingency. All commitments made to the community as part of the ballot issue have been completed or will be completed in the near future. So as you can see, there's a lot happening across the district and we will have long lasting positive impact on students, staff and our community. So I will end there and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Dr. Field. I appreciate it. Next is uh, changes to administrative policies. Back to you. Ms. Thompson. Good evening. This evening I have attached to your board packet the list of policies that have been updated since July 1st of 2021. And I'm here to answer any questions that may be surrounding those policies. As you can see, we updated roughly 100 policies for various reasons with an explanation given to each one within your packet. Board, any questions, comments? The only comment I have is we have new policies that discuss the details of if you are over age 60, right to, to um, the um, senior citizen uh, tax workoff program that is correct 60 if you're over age 60 and you live in the district and you volunteer you have to fill out a form you have to pass a um, background check and and it's subject to availability but you can work off up to i want to say 800 dollars out of your annual tax bill and it's basically you get paid minimum wage am i right you are correct. It's the district's portion of your tax bill up to the $800 that you would be qualified to receive. OK, age. very good, very good. So uh, but anyways, it's a great opportunity to have those folks over 60. I won't call them senior citizens because that's not the case. We are very young. No, yes, because I do fit into it. But uh, it, if you if you have friends who are retired, what a great opportunity. My mom and, and dad used to go into um, elementary schools and read to kids. What a great opportunity. So I just I, I want to Anytime I can, I can push that, I, I'm going to do it. So thank you. Tina and I have helped that program. We've put some of them to work for board stuff, putting some of our bags together. So FYI. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, it's not just reading to, to children. So great. Any other things to talk about? Yes, Mr. Saul. Oh, I was going to say uh, that I really like the format that you had all the explanations there, so it made it really easy. So. Thank you for that. Thank you for that feedback. And as you can see, our our policies are categorized by letter. So our G policies are our employee employee staff policies, our J policies, our student policies, and then our K policies are our community policies. So it, it is organized in alphabetical order, and that is the nomenclature that we follow for our, our organizing our policies. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Thank you. Now we're up to board development. The uh, 2022, by the way, since I'm going to talk about something, I 
I normally, uh, we, we don't do this very often, but we have a special guest. Representative Sane, Shane Sandridge is in our audience. And Representative Sandridge, I just want to thank you. We're honored to have you here. Um, if you live in District 20, it's probably about a 60 or 70 percent likelihood that he is your state representative. So we're honored to have you here and we appreciate it. Um, the uh, 2022 Colorado Association of School Boards, the CASB Legislative Conference, is this uh, coming up in February, Thursday and Friday, the 24th and 25th in Denver. And I'm just wondering, you don't have to commit necessarily, but but do we have a sense of who's going to attend? Okay, Ms. Cloninger, you're going to attend. Um, do we know? Do you, are y'all? Yes, I hope to attend, Mr. Lavelle. Okay, so sounds like, I, I, Ms. Cons, I think you, you nodded. Um, full disclosure, um, a year ago, um, myself and three of my classmates and our wives planned a trip to Hawaii. Um, the day after one board meeting and we come back the day before another board meeting, um, and that happens to fall over this time. So I will not be in attendance. Um, so I apologize. I have attended uh, several of these and it's very good. You get a chance to go down on the House floor, uh, typically. Oh, Ms. Ms. Matson, she's awesome. Uh, she, she, she makes me look good, which is, uh, I, I greatly appreciate it. And, and the other thing I, I wanted to ask, and this is why I, I kind of mentioned Representative Sandridge. Typically on Friday, we try to have lunch with our legislators and typically half of them can make it the, the other half are busy but did, uh, do you guys think that you would like to do that um mr temby does that sound like a plan for you as well if you yeah i'd love to uh see okay. uh, representative sandridge and any of his colleagues that would be great and and, and we will treat um and it's it's at mcdonald's but but that's okay <laughs> no. yeah so um You guys treat him. Yeah, you want there. us to treat him. I'm the treasurer, so I'll, I'll treat. Um, I was going to say, I announced last time that the 24th of February was that STEM um, fair over at Encompass Heights, and I didn't realize it coincided. So any of you that are listening that want to maybe judge a very cool STEM fair at an elementary school, hit me up because apparently we're going to be gone. <laughs> Very good. Um, so that's so that's the uh, Casby Legislative Conference. So what I'm hearing is um, Ms. Matson will will register four of us to go to the conference. And again, I, I apologize. I don't understand that, but I'm just saying she's going to register us for the conference as well. OK, uh, next is the governance process policy GP 4.2 governing styles and values language revision discussion at our last um, work session uh, nearly a month ago we had a, a pretty good I think it was a good healthy discussion about this and we made a, a couple of changes and I, I just wanted to bring this up the the plan expectation is we will vote on this on consent on the 20 January meeting but um, um, Andy is it possible to pull up the draft revision uh, yeah so the, the the two main changes were that we added our um, our, va uh, our value statements. Um, yes, we added our new value statements, which we believe people are the heart of our success. We believe relationships matter. We believe in quality education. And then further down, um, that that la that yeah, the last bullet on that first page, um, we we said uh, whether in the classroom or at home, students achieve best in a nurturing environment where physical, intellectual, and we added social, mental health as well are emphasized. So. Those are the substantive changes. The rest we were, are just wordsmithing. So, um, board, do we need to want to discuss any more regarding this? Well, I still have concern with the one above it, and I I still don't want that language in there. But I understand where you guys come from. But I think virtuous brings in a religious aspect that does not incorporate the entirety of our twenty six thousand students. And it's not to take away from character. I just think that the language that we use needs to be inclusive and it is important for our academic growth to have character, but I don't think it's equal in importance to the academic growth. Mr. That's Salt. my two cents. Yep. Uh, I disagree. I think virtuous has a moral connotation to it, but not necessarily religious. And I absolutely believe that we need moral character coming out. Thank you. Any other thoughts? 
OK, so the plan is to put that on consent uh, at the next meeting. All right, finally, uh, other business resolution 13 dash 22 expulsion appeal. We need a motion to approve resolution 13 dash 22 to affirm uh, the expulsion appeal. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. OK. Was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success? This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>